Hello and welcome to The Sanctuary, a safe space to speak from the heart. I'm your host, Israel, and my guest today in The Sanctuary is someone I've been dying to talk to. <laughs> we always meet, like, quickly, two seconds. I'm like, we need to do this. Michelle yeah. Rowe. Uh, oh, my God, I just did it again. Cindy <laughs> McNeil of Michelle Rowe Fashion and Solo Productions. Thanks for coming to The Sanctuary today. Thank you. It's so good to see you, Israel. It's always a pleasure I know, to I talk know you to you. Told- I, I know you told me this story, but you need to share it again. Because, like, every time I see I'm almost like, Michelle this, Michelle that. But then, Father, no, 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 no. Michelle is a brand and Cindy is a person. So, <laughs> what was the story behind the Michelle name? It's hilarious. Everyone calls me Michelle. I answer to it. It's my own fault now because I, <laughs> <laughs> we uh, named the company after one of my best friends, Michelle Lazo. Uh, we were out for her birthday, and she was wearing this really cu- cute kimono, and she was getting hot, so she went to take it off. And my husband, Robbie, they call him Robert when he's having a couple. Um, so <laughs> he was like, he was like, oh, she says, do you want to wear this, Robbie? He's like, sure. And then he's on the dance floor, and he's flowing, and everyone's trying to buy this thing off him, and he won't sell it because <laughs> it's hers. And she's like, get my money. <laughs> the whole... <laughs> The whole thing was hilarious. And so it made him want to design like capes for men. Mm. So long story short, he started designing a few for himself. It, they got a lot of attention everywhere we went. We'd get like stopped. Like, where did you get this? Who made this? Where can I get one? Um, so he started making more and uh, we took a few to Vegas and we went out. Like we like going to the club. We just like dancing. We love dancing. So we went out to the clubs and a couple of the clubs, the bouncers were like telling them to come here. We thought we were in trouble, but Mm. (laughs) they were like, where'd you get this? You look great. And my husband's very, it's pretty good looking. So whatever. Anyway, (laughs) so we were getting in these clubs and stuff. So we're like, wait, maybe we should do this. And then we ended up applying and getting into Atlantic Fashion Week. And we just have been rolling since. And that was 2017. So how was that first uh, fashion week atlantic fashion week experience it still makes me smile because it was so much work because we had never done anything like that before so it was a Mm -hmm. ton of work all hands on deck sewing sewing cutting designing but um it was so much fun because it was our first time like choosing models and and meeting people and just being part of it all so Mm -hmm. it was it was a super we met so many people that we're still really close with now at that, including Salifa. Mm. So, <laughs> so that's how we ended up meeting her as well, which was like amazing. Um, and yeah, the rest is, as they say, history. Uh, and how did you guys meet? I know, I know you said it's at the fashion week, but what yeah. happened? Uh, what do you recall happening? Actually, she, she messaged us on our Michelle Robert fashion Instagram account she DM'd us and she was like, your stuff is fire. Like, I want to try it. I love it. It's so different. And I was just freaking out. I like literally grabbed my phone and it was running around, like ran to my husband, this gorgeous goddess thinks our stuff is cool. Like I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't even get over it. And uh, so next thing I know, I, I ended up, we met her at the one of the walks and then we ended up meeting her in person and then she said she would walk for us which she does not walk for anyone so i was just over the moon and she wore our like newspaper extra extra cape and of course she made it look amazing and we've Mm. just been hanging out and working together since Mm. Mm. let's rewind a bit like do you have a, a design background Not at all. Um, The background of my sewing is my grandmother always sewed. Uh, We didn't have much growing up, so we would sew a lot. And um, I was never very small. I was always a bit of a curvy girl. So to make my stuff cool, I'd cut it and make it like, you know, like just insert different pieces, mix and match stuff. So it kind of, that's how I started getting into sewing is just like, I was trying to make my stuff look better on me than it did coming out of the mall. Mm. (laughs) The mall didn't like my, you know, 
So mm, mm. we had to fix. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, and then I guess let's even go way further than that. All, all around that time, you know, growing up, sewing for yourself, like, uh, what did you see yourself growing up to become? Oh, I always thought I was going to be a lawyer because... Oh, why? <laughs> I know, crazy, I know. But um, because I was always um, thinking I should stick up for people and stand up for people. And I always wanted to, like, defend people that got in trouble that wasn't fair and things like that. So that's just kind of how I was naturally. Mm-hmm. So I thought, you know... What better way to do that than to become a lawyer? But didn't work out. I ended up taking... <laughs> what, what, I guess, dissuaded you from going down the legal line? Um, I ended up feeling more of a passion. Like, as I got into my... I started taking commerce it, with the intention to become a lawyer. But I accidentally mm. fell in love with mental health. All of my oh. electives were psychology. And I just Mm -hmm. felt more drawn to helping people that way. So Mm -hmm. in university, I started with a commerce degree and ended up with a marketing and psychology degree. Oh, and uh, how was that? Well, I guess, what influenced that switch? Um, I think I was, there's a lot that influenced it, but I was always drawn to um, kind of picking up for the little guy, you know, and so... I was trying to take care of it in the like defensive way. And then I decided I wanted to take care of it more in the hands-on in the space way. So um, I just, all the electives in psychology just really taught me that, you know, people need people that actually care in these fields. Mm -hmm. Cause I ran into a lot of people that didn't care. Um, My family took in foster children. I have over 40 brothers and sisters because my mom and dad were foster parents growing up and I saw firsthand how crappy the system was for the kids. Um, You know, it was just so all of a sudden, so kind of unfair. They're coming with like just barely anything and no idea why they're here. It's just so unfair, you know? Um, So I started looking into that side of things and uh, yeah, it made me work with, kids in care. And so I I started out working in group homes and small option homes. Um, And then I was in a crisis center for basically the last stop in Nova Scotia before you have to leave the province for like what they would say behavior, but what I would say was lack of connection. And uh, I did that for a long time. And then I worked in the women's prison for a bit and I worked in halfway houses trying to help women get jobs after they get out of prison, things Mm -hmm. like that. So I did that for 10 years and then I kind of burnt out. You know, I I was trying to take it all home and it got to be quite heavy. So I ended up switching, uh, going back to school, actually um, went back to Dal. My first degree was at St. Mary's and then I went back to Dal for uh, disability management and things like that. And, uh, I ended up not completing that degree. Um, I decided to work instead, and I kept working. So. And what was the job uh, you took that time? Um, I just kept working with youth that were in trouble like uh, and things like that. For I did that for a while because I really was drawn to the kids and mm-hmm. like helping the kids feel better about their bad situations, you know? Um, and that their situation didn't have to define them, mm. you know. Mm. So I was doing that. You too. know, I, yeah. I think one thing, uh, and just in general, that I believe everyone needs is just a champion, right? Yeah. And you just even need one person. Yeah. I, I, you know, I'm just speaking from my own experience. Like, I, I'm lucky that I had more than one person that just made me believe I can fly. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I have to work for it, but. You know, just having that one person that says, okay, listen, you know, life is not always going to be awesome, but you are alive, you have goals, you can, you know, dig in and walk towards it. And and I think having someone like that, you know, just one person is, is just a major, major, major help. Yeah. So first of all, thank you for that. But like, why though? <laughs> why? <laughs> 
So now, like, how I, I mean, I know that? you said you, like, you know, you your parents, like, had foster, um, like, yeah. you had foster siblings growing up. But, like, that can't just be the only reason, right? No, there's a lot of reasons. Like, you know, there was different things. It's, it's such a big question, really, to answer. But um, I also had a lot of um, stuff happen. I have a younger brother who's gay. And growing up gay in Cape Breton, it's a small place. It's very not, it wasn't tolerant at all at the time, much more tolerant now. But so I was constantly defending him. And um, one of our foster children was, he was very dark and people would make fun of him. Call, like they thought he was native and he, he wasn't, but it didn't matter either way. They would just give him such a hard time. So I was always the person that would jump in and just, you, you know, like I throw hands. I throw hands. I can't lie. But I don't anymore. But back then, I threw hands because it was like, <laughs> it was like, no. Well, there, there is these stereotypes <laughs> that, like, you know, girls shouldn't fight. Uh, but you, like, took that on his head and spun yeah. it around. Yeah, well, then boys shouldn't have messed with my brothers. How about that? <laughs> 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 so I wouldn't have had to fight if they weren't messing with my friends and my family, mm, you know. So, mm, but mm. that was how I was. I just I can't stand by. I still don't. I just there's no standing by for me. If I see something, I'm in. I'm in it because I just think it's mm. there's no need. Like we need to choose kindness, compassion, and love for one another. And you know, you don't have to <clears throat> like someone to respect them. You don't have mm. to agree with someone to respect them. And I, I don't I don't care what you come from, you deserve respect. So mm. I, I can't I have very little tolerance for disrespect. Mm. So, you know, you, you go through St. Mary's and then you come out and like which one was it? So you started right at group homes, you said? Yeah, right away. I got a job fresh out of school working in group homes. And then I quickly got promoted to a supervisor there. And I, then I was running a bunch of group homes and emergency placement facility. And so what are group homes? So basically group homes is a government funded facility for people with some sort of mental health needs where they live together. So it's called a group home because there's usually four or five bedrooms in these homes and they have mm -hmm. staff 24 seven that help them with everything they need, like taking their medication, cooking their meals, helping them learn to do laundry, life skills, things like that. So I worked mm. with all kinds of um, youth and adults with all kinds of amazing, you know, different things like Down syndrome or uh, ODD, OCD, uh, uh, schizophrenia, just everything you can think of. I've worked with all types of people like that. And, you know, it was a lot of fun and I learned a lot more from them than they learned from me. I promise you that. So, mm -hmm. you know, I just, and I would always organize fun events and make it like exciting and, you know, fun like that um, for people. So that was kind of my jam. I was like, I'm going to make this happy. I'm going to make this fun. I'm going to make everybody, you know, happy to be here. And I had like really great staff and, you know, when I didn't, I got rid of them. Like, cause it's, if they weren't there for the right reasons, then I made sure they weren't there. Uh, mm. So it's like protection kind of thing as well as like protective of them. Cause they're so sweet and amazing and vulnerable, but it taught me a lot about the system and the government and how things work. And it's so slow and frustrating, but um, yeah, I got a very behind the scenes look at all of that. Mm. What are some good reasons for someone to be a staff of uh, like a group home? And what are some not so good reasons you picked up that you'd let the person go? Yeah, so great reasons, which was 99% of the people I worked with was they just wanted to make a difference and help out and be kind and, you know, kind of be champions for people that needed a little extra support. But mm. and so you know, you have to have a lot of patience and love and joy in your heart to like properly care for someone that 
you know, needs a lot and isn't always okay, you know? Mm. Um, but then we had the other, the little 1%, and it was people that were, you know, almost like they had this power trip to them where they wanted to, like, look down at or almost, like, dominate, boss around, you know, that kind of a thing. And I just, that's not the place for you. If you're there for that, that's not, mm. that's not the place for you, you know? Mm. And, like... You started at one group home, but as a supervisor, you're taking care of more than one. Yeah. Uh, that's a lot of responsibility. How do you, do you yeah. handle that? Uh, it was a lot. It was, it was, uh, I was kind of working 80 hour weeks, uh, seven days a week. Um, but, you know, it, it was just, it almost was an obsession to make sure everyone was okay. And I was young and I didn't have kids yet. So I had the time and I had the mm -hmm. energy Uh, so I was able to do a lot then when I started having kids, like, and it's like the time thing gets chopped up. So, you know, I wouldn't have been able to put in my 80 hours. I could still put in my 40, you know, but my mm. 80 was like no longer available. <laughs> mm. um, well, for yourself then, 80 hours, even without kids is a lot. Yeah. Right. Uh, how did you manage all that? Just for yourself, how did you manage doing it a weeks? I can't, I can't, I yeah. can't even imagine it. <laughs> I can't imagine it doing it anymore or ever again. <laughs> But at the time, it was just real. I had a lot of drive and a real sense of wanting to uh, prove to myself that I was capable of handling these sorts of, you know, jobs and doing a good job and making sure everybody was good. Um, so mm -hmm. I would put in all kinds of extra time. Even my boss would be like, you don't need to be here at every call. But I <laughs> just, <laughs> I just wanted to make sure everything was handled and good. So I was a mm -hmm. little, you know, if the phone rang, I was there, like I would just show up. So, uh, and, and sometimes it was really scary stuff. Like there was, some of it was, you know, there'd be violent outbursts, there'd be, you know, things like that. Well, I wouldn't want to be a staff person where my boss didn't show up when I was in a violent situation. I want my boss mm. to show up. So I would show up. I would kind of mm. just be who I wished that was there for me, you know? So that's how I handled it. I just was all day, every day. And mm. uh, One thing, um, I mean, I don't want to say obsessed, but when you're that yeah. focused at something, Um, you can say obsessed. It gets difficult. <laughs> <laughs> it gets difficult to unplug, right? Yeah. Um. When what happened, and uh, when you realized, okay, it, it's time to move on, and how difficult was that move process of moving on? Yeah, it was. It was really difficult, and actually, um, what happened was I had a marriage breakdown. I had my my first husband, we were together since we were young, too young. And, uh, he, he ended up cheating on me and it just broke my ability to, to hang on to the tolerance of the steady, constant work. Um, so I moved out obviously. And I, that's when I started another job. I ended up Uh, I ended up working at the bank. This is how far left I went. I, I ended up working at the bank for a couple of years in between while mm -hmm. I was just trying to get my head right again. And then mm -hmm. I found Robbie and then I found fashion and it kind of got, um, the reason we ended up getting into, to doing the fashion shows and stuff is because the two of us suffered from a lot of confidence issues. And we really wanted to show people that they could be confident no matter what. Uh, so mm -hmm. our stuff was all about being confident with exactly who you are and never apologizing for who you are or who you were born to be. Um, so mm -hmm. that's him and I were just such a, it was such a synergy and such a, a like a massive energy. I felt like it was like a second life for me, like a new almost like a new I don't know a whole new world was open to me with him because we just we get each other we're both so passionate mm. we're both alphas 
And it's like sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it's not good, but most of the time it's super like, wow, mm -hmm. we got, we got a lot done today. We're both really driven and we mm -hmm. both really care about people and making sure people feel welcome and, you know, accepted. Mm. Okay. That sounds great. But let's go back a bit. How is it <laughs> like working at the bank? The bank was boring. It was terrible. I hated every day. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was it was what the doctor just ordered for yeah. you. Then wouldn't you say it was pretty brainless as far as like uh, my responsibilities were just like making sure the dots were dotted and the T's were crossed, and it was like just super. What what were you doing there? <laughs> like I guess what was your job requirement? So I did like basic bank teller, but I also did mortgages and loans. Oh, okay. So like wow, okay. like boring. <laughs> <laughs> but see, the thing is, when you're outside looking in, yeah. like, when you're trying to get a loan, it's all complicated. So yeah. But I guess coming from where you came from, it's like oh man, you know, you don't um, and you are not whatever. I guess the hmm, issue might be. It would be, you know, it will pale in comparison to where you came from. Exactly. That's how it was. It just, no, none of it felt very important to me. Mm. It was like, who cares about these numbers? Like, right. You right. know, he's like flying, <laughs> uh, he's like going to on a space rocket and then uh, coming from there to riding a bicycle. Yeah, or something. exactly. <laughs> I felt like I went from using all the brain power to like, Two <laughs> percent. <laughs> um, how long did you do that for? Uh, about a year and a half, and then oh wow, yeah, and then my cousin. Uh, this is, I don't mean to go dark on you here, but <laughs> my cousin got killed in Afghanistan, and they. He was it like in the army or? Yeah, he was. He was a sergeant in the military, and he he ended up getting um, killed in an IED explosion oh wow yeah and so i was just like it that rocked my world again because he grew we grew up across the street from each other and we were like mm. we were like siblings we were very very close and um when that happened i wanted to go to trenton he was getting brought in and i wanted to be there for the highway of heroes and bring him home and my work was like nah you can't have all this time and i was like Bye. <laughs> I, yeah, that, I, I quit. That doesn't make sense, though. Like, <laughs> well, because it I was don't understand. Ju just a cousin. You don't get bereavement leave for to them. Just a cousin. I don't understand. I still don't get it. Like, no. Anyway, yeah, sure, okay, yeah. Well, I mean, that's good enough reason. So, yeah, I needed uh, it yeah. anyway, and he like it honestly was the push I needed to get back into what I was really meant to be doing and how I was really mm. meant to be living my life. I went on mm. autopilot for there, there I did. I, I did. I went on autopilot and that shook me back out of it. And, um, I haven't gone back to banking since. <laughs> mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then was that when you went back to dial or, well, I went, yeah, I went back to Dell. I did all of that. I met Robbie, like all of that happened right there. I actually met Robbie two weeks. No, wait, wait, three weeks, three weeks right before my cousin Jimmy was killed. And so mm -hmm. it was like, I don't know, it all just kind of clicked all in at once. And mm -hmm. it, it felt like it was time to just start something else. How did you meet? Me and Robbie? Mm hmm So we met at the Blue Nose 10K Marathon. Oh, you ra run? Yeah, not anymore. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I was I was doing running and stuff then, and that's how I ended up meeting him. And uh, so we have three kids. So he had uh, Julius is our oldest. So I met him and Julius at the 10K run. So Julius was doing the run as well. So the only reason oh. I met Robbie is because I thought his kid was cool. <laughs> 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 I was like, this little guy's amazing. And I kept being like, hey, every time we see him. 
And the, my running partner already knew Robbie, so she introduced us. And uh, uh. then we all went out to brunch after. McMack Tavern, what up? And then, <laughs> and then we just started talking, and then my mom was there. It's this hilarious. My mom's crazy. Mm. So she was saying, oh, you, ne- you need to call this guy. This guy likes you. And at that time, you know, <laughs> I was on man hate. Like, <laughs> there was a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So I was like, no way. I can't talk to any boys right now. But mom was like, just like message him on Facebook, my little cute little mom. So I did. And then he asked me out and then we went out and then we, he never mm. left my apartment since. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, I mean, you, you have this, uh, intro, uh, interesting introduction, I guess, to the, some of the difficult parts of being human, Yeah, you know, taking care of uh, these kids, these people, Pretty much for years and years and years, and then you go to the bank. Uh, I guess rediscover yourself finding Robbie, um, and then fashion. But like, was it ever a night like something you were you had in mind that you'd uh, like start a fashion label, or it just really came down to that jacket, and that was it? It so for me, I was always. I was never a small girl, right? So for me, I never thought someone like me could do that. So Uh, it was a confidence issue, a huge confidence issue. It was always something that I thought was awesome, that I loved. I was obsessed with everything fashion. I watched fashion TV, Jeannie Becker, like all of that growing up. I'd stay up all night watching that stuff. And like, even Mm. to this day, like the project runways, the, like I watch all of it, like anything Tyra Banks did, like, you know, I was all in and it's just something that I didn't believe in myself enough to do, to pursue Mm -hmm. because of like, I was never, I was like short and a little bigger, but now I know like, it doesn't matter fashions for everyone and now I promote that everywhere I go and the same with Mm. Robbie his confidence was not good and he's a very attractive man I'm biased but I think he's a very attractive man (laughs) (laughs) and he his confidence was was not good at all when I met him he didn't even know he was good looking I was like I gotta fix this you're 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 amazing (laughs) like what is wrong so between that we we really helped build each other up in a really right. like great way and it just gave us the confidence to to start doing stuff to step in the the limelight to be okay right. with people seeing us and things like mm. that before i was like like this i would have never done i'm a behind the scenes girl you know but now with the since i've met robbie and we started doing this my confidence is like who cares what anyone thinks of me except me like you know so mm. that's that's where I'm at now. It's like none of my business what your opinion is of me. Only what mm-hmm. my opinion is of me, you know? Right. Um and then, you know, the jacket happened, you did Atlantic Fashion Week and then they met Sully. But how do you go from how wearing and uh, wearing one of your outfits and walking for you to now you two walking together? Yeah, so what happened there was we just started doing a lot of projects together. We were at a lot of the same stuff. Plus I just, we have a lot of the same beliefs and morals. So we super connect there about how we want to see fashion and how we want to push the envelope and let everybody in. And uh, the two of us feel very similar like that. So we started just doing more and more together. And then we were just hanging out cause we wanted to. And, um, Every time I went to something with Soli, I just see she was doing everything. Like she's carrying everything in. She's tearing it all down. She's like cleaning up the garbage. She's coaching. She's, I was like, you need help. Like you can't do all of this yourself. I'm like, do you Mm -hmm. mind if I like, can I, I just started helping at like one thing. And then I just started showing up for everything she was doing. And then we just decided that, maybe we should do that more permanently because we love working together. And we just like, I love supporting her and she loves supporting me. 
and we're just like, I don't know, we're each other's hype girls, really. And, <laughs> <laughs> and she's just so talented. And, you know, I just wanted to give her the space to do what she needed to do. And I could do all that background stuff that she didn't have time for. And, mm. uh, you know, and, and she does that for me. There, even like this weekend, we were down on the waterfront doing our pop-up fundraiser um, because we're trying to raise money for Atlantic Scholarship Organization. So even that, yeah. she's like getting after me. Cindy, where's your labeling? Cindy, like you should be promoting your bow ties. You should be promoting, you know, she's trying to get make money for me while I'm trying, to, I'm there to help her and she's talking about me. And that's just who she is. <laughs> you know, she, that's just who she is all the time. And I love yeah. that about her. And, you know, we're just, I don't know. I just, I... She's family to me, you know? So mm. even my kids, like, they call her auntie. She's always buying them sugar. I'm like, stop buying my kids sugar. <laughs> 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 but they love it because they know if they see auntie, they get sugar. Like, it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> and now, uh, like, all three of my kids have modeled for me, and they've modeled for her. But my youngest, mm. Chloe, is signed with her and does – work with her she's done commercials with her you know it's it's fantastic and we just we just love working together and um i would we were doing so much together she was like i want you to be my coo and i was like what's a coo <laughs> <laughs> she's like that's the job you're doing <laughs> i was cracking up she's like it's chief operations officer and that's what you do here for me all the time I want to make it official. So I was mm -hmm. like, okay, you know, so I just, <laughs> I said yes. And now we're still rolling hot. And, uh, you know, through the shutdown, we had a lot of challenges, obviously, but we got mm -hmm. a lot going on now and we're getting really busy again. And it's, you know, the restrictions are lifting. We're getting back to be able to do our like recordings and some of our outside stuff. So it's exciting that we get to roll up again. Mm. Mm, and that's the other thing that just came to mind now was how you handled the pandemic. Like, you know, yeah. early Mar March last year, I think it's when it, it really kicked in March 2020. Yeah. <laughs> um, and how was that for you personally? And like, you know, being part of Solo Productions yeah, and was, Michelle Robert. Yeah, it was all of it. So it was it was, you know, fashion took a huge hit. All the arts did. Um, a, a lot of different businesses did. But speaking from our side of things, fashion took a huge hit. And um, it was really tough because we were scheduled to do a lot of amazing things that year. We were supposed to travel to Germany. We are supposed to travel to Ottawa and uh, a couple of more places to do shows with the bass project and um so for michelle robert we were supposed to do all of these big stages and these great events and they all got canceled well postponed they're, they're still could happen they're still talking about them happening but you know this is uh, almost two years later and it's still not that right. you know so is yeah, it yeah when okay. you're a, a brand that's rising and then all of a sudden you flatline it's 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 pretty devastating for uh, mm. sales and things like that. The business side of the boring side of things. But uh, so we weren't able to do any of that. It kind of took the wind out of our sails a bit if as mm. far as that goes. But then we decided to do a fashion summit so we could get all of our local people together with some people around the world talking about fashion online and maybe help each other get through the pandemic, help each other pivot to online, help each other, you know, ask questions and, and things like that. So we did that and we interviewed a lot of amazing people. So Letha was one of them. And uh, it was it, it was really successful. We did that for four days and that mm -hmm. ended up doing really well. So that got us through a part of the pandemic and, uh, you know, and then, um, when George Floyd was killed, it really affected Soli a lot and Soli Productions and all of our talent. So that hit us really hard. So then we wanted to do, we did a couple of things for the company 
and for the people in the company to have a place to get together and and try and uh, you know support each other because we're we're isolated in a pandemic, we're hurting mm-hmm. so bad, and we're all wondering what we can do to support each other. So all of the the pe- all of the people it basically solely is full of every kind of person you can imagine. We're we're a very diverse group uh, of talent, and um, mm. so all of the talent wanted to support each other and support the ones that needed uh, help because a lot of our talent were really hurting. So we did a couple of events and, uh, you know, one went really well and it, it was like a vigil and we went down to um, the Spring Garden and Citadel Hill and that all went really beautifully well. We did, you know, we did a kneel and we we just kind of spoke and talked to each other. It was It was beautiful and powerful and amazing. And the second one was we decided to get together and start um, a march across the city for um, to support all of the black talent in our company. And one of our talent, Tyree Haley, he wanted to lead the march. And so we did that. And, you know, it was it was amazing. There was a group of eight of us that organized and ran the whole thing. And, but, you know, we got a little heat, you know, we got a little heat from that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that happening. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Cause it was especially on Instagram. Yeah, it was. I feel like if it was people that didn't know us, you know, cause if they were mm. there, they, they weren't there and they didn't know us. If they were there and they knew us, they would have seen what was real. But uh, mm-hmm. we, we got a lot of hate for that because some people were saying that the white people were leading the march. Well, mom and I, my my mom just turned 65 this weekend. And so her and I, were we were up front, but we were stopping the cars so Tyree could get through safely. But people thought that we were leading the march. And they had mm-hmm. a lot to say about that. And, and so did I, because we weren't. And, um, but to me, it was a super powerful day for our entire group, uh, Sully Productions. We had, we had uh, over 100 people there, and we walked all the way from St. Mary's University all the way up to Africville. When mm-hmm. the police joined us, I fell back, and I was behind Tyree. But mm-hmm. until the police were clear in the streets, literally, Mom and I were, like, stopping traffic. So we walked all the way up to Africville. When we got up there, there was some people there from Africville, some families from Africville. And we had a really beautiful friend of ours who's also... Wait, you walked to Africville from where? From St. Mary's University. All the way up Roby. Like from the bottom Yeah, to, that's a long-ass walk. It was a long-ass walk, and it was really emotional, and it was really powerful. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was, it was really needed and... Uh, all of the talent, especially Tyree, w- was just so grateful that we did it because they needed it, you know? Mm. Not going to cry. <laughs> 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 but we got up to um, Africville and we had, uh, so a really good friend of ours, Bernadette Hamilton, she's also an, a big advocate for Black Nova Scotia. This is This is a woman with like a massive heart and She's amazing. She led us in prayer. She said a bunch of words there as well. And, you know, we all just kind of got into a big circle and just shared experiences and talked. And then we went home. Peaceful. Mm. You know, there was nothing to it. It was just a long, beautiful day. It was really peaceful. And then it was over. Um, So, you know, that's kind of how it went down. And we had we had a few people message us from different groups saying that they were also doing an event that day and that we shouldn't but we tried to like space it where we did ours at 2 because there was a big event at 10 for indigenous people and a big event um that was going on all day for indigenous people and I, we also have um 
you know, we, we were like, okay, we need to make sure that we're not hurting anyone. So I spoke with them. I was like, do you want us to bring our walk to your event? Like immediately after, cause I was trying to like make everybody happy kind of thing. And, um, you know, ended up, you know, we had a couple of good conversations. So now I'm more in touch and more talking with a lot of the people that we were speaking with that day and we're doing a lot more behind the scenes with them as well. So Mm -hmm. it actually created a lot of collaborations too. That was just unexpected because of our, you know, care and compassion for the community that we live in. So Mm -hmm. to us, it was, you know, that little bit of negativity was worth the, the bigger picture, I guess. Yeah, you know, uh, and my thing, not just with like stuff like this, just in general, I believe no matter what you do, there always gonna be people that <laughs> like it, and there always gonna be people that fucking hate it. <laughs> it's true. And then there are people that don't even care about. They don't it. even so, know. Yeah. <laughs> so like, whenever I'm doing anything, I can't be worried about the people that will hate. Like they're gonna hate anyway. Yeah. So like, I can't, you know, give myself a headache over what you're gonna say. Yeah. They're going to do their thing. I'm just going to focus on the people I'm doing the thing for. So as long as I know what I'm doing has great intentions behind it, I'm not going to be worried because whatever it is you do, not everybody's just is going to like it. Everyone is going to have the lane they fall into. And I just try to focus on the people that the thing is for and that's it i, I can't that's I can't exactly what we it. did that's exactly what we did because everybody was so upset because they were they felt like they were being devalued as black people and mm. i was like of course you feel like that you know people saying cancel the only black event that was happening not good so i was just like guys let's not worry about it don't even respond to anyone unless you're going to be kind and then i said so we're just going to keep rolling forward with the people and the intentions that we've had from the beginning so that's what we did we just decided to stay positive focus on all the good things that were happening and just move forward with that Mm. okay so i mean your journey so far has led you here Mm -hmm. I'm going to end it with this one though. What's the future hold? Or what are some things you have planned? We have a lot of awesome stuff happening. A lot going on. Some of it, I don't know if I'm allowed to tell you, but I might like sort of tell you. Um, We have, have, uh, so with Soli Productions, it's it's been a wild, amazing ride. We just did, we just released a new fashion line. We're going to be doing a lot with that. So the Soli line and uh, it's called Simply Perfect. There's clothing and there's jewelry because we believe you're all simply perfect exactly the way you are. So we wanted to make sure that that was our message. Um, So we're going to be releasing soon some jewelry, some necklaces, earrings and bracelets and Mm -hmm. also some dresses, some swimsuits, like some underwear like gorgeous stuff and uh, we've done a couple of photo shoots but we only have like demo products so far so we've done Mm -hmm. the demo product photo shoots when we get the real products we'll do the real the real real and uh, we are every year we do fabric of our dna that's our charity fundraiser so in that we're actually going to have a video of our products um, some of our jewelry and clothing on our models. So we taped mm-hmm. that. It's fire. I can't wait for you guys to see it. I'm so excited <laughs> about that. So that's going to be happening. And our, our models are traveling. Um, as soon as we're allowed out, we have a lot of pla- people going to a lot of places. And right now we have models all over. Like we have models in the Caribbean. We have models in, in Europe. We have models all over wall to wall in Canada and we're so we're just building uh that and we're getting ready as soon as the as soon as the travel bans are lifted we'll be doing a lot of shows and stuff and traveling that way 
Uh, mm. You can look for our banners downtown. We're gonna <laughs> we're gonna be having some banners downtown over the summer. I'm really excited and really proud of that. Um, mm -hmm. It's gonna be our models and all the different designers that contributed to fabric of our DNA. And Michelle Robert was one, so Michelle Robert. So I got a double banner because it's Michelle Robert and Soli all in one. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> and uh, you know. Each of our, each of the uh, designers got to choose either one or two models to represent them for the banner. Mm -hmm. So I chose Tyree and Ben. <laughs> Those are my OGs from like, they've been with me for every show. Um, you know, they really are really fabulous people and they, they are everything I believe in as well. They're hardworking, they're good humans, they're, you know, kind, compassionate people. So I really was proud to have them represent us. Mm. So that's all that. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, do you have any idea when the uh, Fabric of a DNA video will be out? Yes, we finally have the thing solidified. It's August 1st. So August, oh, nice. August 1st, we'll be showing it downtown. We'll have a, a, a setup so people can come see it. Um, I'll be sharing, we're, we're waiting to get back permission because of COVID things are kind of dicey. So we're just trying to figure out what we're allowed to do. And we're trying to be mm. as patient as possible. Uh, but the city's been good keeping up with us and letting us know what we're allowed to do. And there's a lot of people like downtown Halifax is on board. They're sponsoring us. They're helping us out. So August 1st, we're going to have it downtown somewhere on the waterfront. And uh, it's going to be a full show. There'll be models there in person, plus the the production of it being shown. And plus, you know, the um, Rogers Square there in the, mm, yeah, yeah, in yeah, the yeah. Nova Center where they have all those big screens. Right, right, right. We'll be going up on that as well. And we'll have stuff set up there as well with the designers and things on August 1st, too. So it's going to be like a big solely day on August 1st. So I'm really, right. really excited about that. In the meantime, right. we're just fundraising and we'll, we're will we going to do the draw for the fundraisers on August 1st as well. So every oh. do yeah, every donation over $20 gets entered into the Soli Prize Package, which is a coaching session with Solifa and a photo shoot. So that's, I want to win that. Like, uh <laughs> 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 yeah, So we'll be drawing for that on August 1st as well. That's great. Um, man, I was just about to say Michelle again. <laughs> it's okay. Cindy, it's okay. <laughs> uh, you know, thanks for sharing your journey so far. And I can't wait to see some of these awesome things you have planned. And I just want to say thank you for coming to the sanctuary today. I had a great time chatting with you. Thank you so much for having me. It was awesome to hang out with you finally. You know, finally, <laughs> finally. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope we get to see you again. I'll send you the invite for August 1st, too, because I'd love to have you there if you want to come. Definitely. I'll, I'll be there. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah, I'm going to be in the city for sure. Thanks yeah. so much, Cindy. Take care, Israel. Thank you.